Yankovic from Del Tico. I'm delighted to be hosting my third Collaborate to Zero in our attempt to share stories and tips and tricks from amazing leaders and inspirational people where I hope to gather all of these uh, conversations and pull them together and deliver them at COP. So hi. Hi Mark, how are you? I'm um, great, great to meet you face to face. Yes, indeed. And thank you so much for your time and joining the Collaborate to Zero chat and series. So I know everybody on the call knows who you are, but it is super inspiring. So I, I thought I would repeat your, your, your resume. A, a New Zealander uh, at heart, a, a lawyer, a qualified lawyer, no, no mean feat, an author, a businesswoman, a restaurant owner, uh, and a sustainability champion. That's, uh, that's not bad. And then, then to mention chef of the year, uh, restaurant of the year, most influential woman in hospitality, non-exec, uh, non-exec director, and I'm you know, Michelin star, green star. That for me is the like the one with the bells and the whistles on, which is super awesome. Did I miss anything else? <laughs> no, I think that probably sums it up. <laughs> Great. Well, today's um, about the restaurant world and how the restaurant world can collaborate, get better, move forward. Um, as I was saying in the preamble, I've got I've got Ali Russell tomorrow, who um, is one of the, the top team at Extreme E and formerly E and Mobility, and how they are going to how they are changing the the uh, automobile industry. Um, so yeah, an exciting week for Collaborate to Zero. Yeah, um, I've got a, I've got a million questions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna, <laughs> kick, I'm gonna fire away. I'm gonna kick off. Um, so the, I think the the first one is. In your in your your restaurant career, where you've worked for some of the world's most amazing restaurants, and to now have your own restaurant, and the the inspiration behind the the menu that you've chosen, is there a moment? Is there something that has kind of inspired you to 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 go in this path? I think it's. I would say it's it's moments um, and just time and and experience and and growing up. Really, I would say. Um, very privileged to have grown up in New Zealand, surrounded by amazing stuff, amazing produce, amazing people, amazing landscape. Um, and I think that probably set the tone without me really knowing, um, you know, when I was young, as to where I kind of wanted to, to be in the future in terms of that path. Yeah, it's interesting how, how people who have grown up in nature have this, it's kind of built in, and whether you're grow up surfing where you grow up with, with, with nature around you. Just it's, it's part of who you are. Mm. Um, one of the things that's obviously going nuts is the, the new, I would say new demand for sustainable eating or, or interest in, in you know, more environmentally focused food sources and stuff. What's kicking that off? What's the, what do you think has kind of, have we got to the tipping point what do you think is in, is driving that behavioural change? I don't think we've got to a certain point, no. Um, I mean, I think, well, it depends which way you look at it. I think we've got to a certain point in terms of the situation we're in, um, but in terms of actually people being aware of it. Um, I think there's a lot more consciousness now than there was, you know, kind of two years ago, even 12 months ago, pre-COVID, I would say. And I think that, I think COVID's taught us all many things. Um, it's definitely challenged us in many ways. Um, but I think there has been some good to come out of what's happened. And I think just that, you know, initial pause and actually seeing what was going on when everything that we were kind of, you know, I kind of have this memory of us being kind of a bit on a mouse wheel and just constantly going and going and going. It was only when the wheel was actually stopped for us that we were able to, to kind of hop off and, and sit back and actually, you know, see things at a distance and to see where things were from a, um, more of a 360 approach, I would say. Yeah, I think there's certainly uh, this, the, the, the small silver lining in COVID is it did force everybody just to stop, take stock mm. and, and think about their lives and how we can, we can build back better, build mm. better into the future. Um, I, I, I totally agree. And if that, if that is the, t- the, the tipping point, but that's driving better behavior and people behaving better, that's, yeah. 
a, a, a silver lining of a, a pretty dire situation. Mm. Um, planted, I love the description of planted. It's not a book for vegans. It's a, a book <laughs> of amazing recipes just without meat. <laughs> what was the, the inspiration behind that? I think from my perspective, it was twofold. I think I've mentioned, obviously, being very privileged to grow up in New Zealand, surrounded by amazing produce. And, you know, I actually genuinely love vegetables. Um, it's not kind of me doing it for the sake of it. I actually, you know, have a genuine love for them. Um, I really enjoy eating them and everything that goes around, you know, the growth, how that happens. Um, so from that perspective, that, that was kind of a natural, I guess, progression. In terms of actually writing a book that was fully plant-based, I think for me, when I opened Treadwells seven years ago, um, I wanted it to be really accessible and really enjoyable for people so that when they went out to eat, they wouldn't, you wouldn't have to, um, you know, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be hard. And I think sometimes, you know, if we go back seven years ago and, and people that had allergies or intolerances or just dietary preferences, sometimes it was quite difficult to be able to, you know, figure out what you could eat off a menu. So from my perspective, it was having everything just kind of super simple, black and white, that if dishes were plant-based, if they, you know, had all the allergens on them, um, then that was just a really easy and enjoyable way for people to be able to to kind of I guess have more of a choice and actually make that choice in a in an environment that wasn't kind of judged or wasn't um you know it wasn't hard it was actually all there in black and white and it was a seamless kind of dining experience really so that was I guess where I came to and then we're looking at a lot of plant-based food I looked for a resource um as a chef that that was kind of plant-based recipes and couldn't find too much out there you know there was a lot of kind of I guess um at home cooking and a lot down the kind of you know chickpea curry route I would say <laughs> um but couldn't find too much in terms of actually I guess a chef approach to it so thought well actually there's a bit of a gap in the market there so that was kind of the emphasis behind it well I was just thinking about the the, the name was that the inspiration behind the name I think it's a wonderful treadwell which is, you know, the, the, or is there a bit of serendipity there where it's about, you know, tread lightly, be conscious of? No, I mean, that was, it, it wasn't actually, but I think it's become that since it was a, one of those, I guess, a double entendre where it was, you know, that was, we actually named it after the um, Butler and the Agatha Christie novel, The Mystery of Seven Dials. Um, but interestingly, yeah, as I've come along, you know, moved forward it's like actually you know we, we want to be able to tread well as we move forward so yeah kind yeah, of it's a, cool, it's a cool name yeah um with your on your website and on your sustainability piece you talk about your suppliers and and um working with with, with local suppliers has that been challenging have you had to have you had to push local suppliers and 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 vice versa have local suppliers come to you saying, have you thought of this or have you looked at that? Or is there, has there been inspiration both ways? There's been a lot of inspiration both ways, but I would say the challenge is actually just finding them. Um, and then so the first thing is, is finding them. The second thing is actually getting the product to us. Um, and that still feels a bit harder than it should be in some respects. Um, and nowhere is there kind of just a directory of this is, you know, these are, amazing producers suppliers you know and across you know 360 in terms of, of you guys as well in terms of cleaning products it's not just food it's it's food beverage um just anything that comes into a restaurant is you know and to be able to find the best things that can work a for the restaurant but b also you know from a, a more of a, a wider approach in terms of a circular economy so yeah, on that perspective, I'd say it's, it is a bit harder than it should be, but I kind of feel that if I could do it, then hopefully that might make it easier for others and so more people will will jump on board. Yeah, I mean, one of the inspirations on for me for this you know, chat series is exactly that. In my previous life, I knew everybody across all the different corporates all doing the same thing. And within five phone calls, we could you know, understand the market and you know, since starting this, it's been unbelievably difficult to try and mm. to find people who we can, you know, talk to, get decisions made and move forward. And I think to reach scale, we need to collaborate. We need to just, you know, all be in the same room and, and all trying to, trying to get there. So um, 
I suppose the challenge is how do we do that and get and get great brands and great businesses onto that uh, onto that platform. And I suppose with the the Michelin star, the green the green star, do you see? I mean, for me, obviously, and obviously for you, Michelin stars are 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 it. Having a green star, I think, is just totally awesome. And do you think that is your behavior and other restaurants like yours pushing the sector? Do you think that has driven their their the, the reason they've come up with the green star? Um, I think it's something that is definitely needed, and, and they've needed to recognise it. I think if we look at a traditional, you know, and I'm talking very traditional kind of Michelin star restaurant you know, waste comes into it in terms of food costs, but it doesn't come into it in terms of anything else. Um, and sourcing and just, I think that notion of a circular economy, it, it, it doesn't really factor into it. So I think for them to recognise that actually, in a way, it's, you know, you kind of need to have something that's not a middle ground, but something that can, I guess, affirm what restaurants are doing and something for people to, um, you know, work towards as well. I think that's important. So... I think there's probably still a bit of work to be done in the, the kind of quantifiable part of it, but in terms of actually just the overarching um, messaging, it's kind of, it's, it's quite a clear in terms of that's what certain restaurants are doing. It's what they believe in. It's where they want to move forward to. So for me, it's kind of the beginning of it. I think they've got a lot more to go with it, but I think it's great that it's, it's finally kind of come about. In the in the Sunday Times supplement this weekend, I was I was delighted to see there's a massive pull out on on uh, carbon and carbon reduction and carbon statistics, and I was totally shocked to see that that um, food supply, the supply chain around food, is the highest and the worst, and yeah, at 25 percent. And the next closest was construction at 10, which <laughs> I didn't know it was that high. How, what do you, how do we change that? Um, I think it's very much, I, you know, I don't, I don't have the answers if I did, you know, <laughs> I'd probably be, I don't know, I wouldn't be sitting in a restaurant. Um, I think, but for me, it's very much a journey. And I think that that's what, you know, kind of my next path is very much about um, finding best practice in some ways. And there is no silver bullet, um, but I think, the starting point is just for everybody to be conscious about it and aware of it. And, you know, if I can, again, for me, dining out shouldn't be something that you're, you know, you shouldn't be preached to or, or told to. It should be very much an enjoyable, pleasurable experience. So from that perspective, I'm conscious of not, um, you know, bombarding or preaching with information. It's very much about the messaging is there. It, it's kind of probably slightly subtle in some respects but there's more if you want to find out more and that's what my team and I are working on at the moment is you know a way to be able to find out more rather than it being kind of in your face and all over menus it's kind of like there's a way that people can find out more um and I think just you know being just talking about it being conscious about it the more we can talk about it the more we can figure out the best way to do it um but I think it's in many ways I think there's a huge shift that needs to happen on the part of consumers as opposed to food service to be honest um and an understanding of it and you know the supermarkets i think are pretty uh yeah they're not the good guys in this <laughs> to uh yeah, put it politely um you know from packaging to waste to portions like you know what you can buy thing it's yeah it, it's a minefield and i think it's a 360 across the board and just you know messaging i think there was something recently that farms that were supposedly um, you know, supplying supermarkets didn't even exist. They were just kind of a, a branding exercise from the supermarket. So, again, I think that, yeah, being able to find where food comes from, how it got to your plate is super important. And I think that was, you know, potentially one thing growing up in New Zealand, we we had to eat seasonally because we were so isolated. You know, at that point in time, this is going back many, many years now. Um, and, you know, I was, I was pretty shocked when I came to the UK and, and – walked into the supermarket and found you know asparagus and strawberries in in winter um it was yeah a bit of a shock to the system really compared to what i was used to i think it, it feels like there's a we need some kind of technology disruption to help help get mm. the 
Um, I, you may know the answer. I, I've been I've been racking my brains and I've been looking through all my notes. Um, I I think it was I, I think how old I am. Uh, I, I think I was on a B Corp panel and I one of the delegates on the panel is a guy who um, has a polytunnel social enterprise. So he basically has polytunnels um, that he then allocates to a restaurant and he gets local people disabled socially, you know, social upliftment projects and gets them to go and grow stuff in a polytunnel for a specific restaurant. And I, for the life of me, I can't remember who they are. Have you, <laughs> have you ever come across, I suppose the question around there is that sounds like an amazing collaboration between social enterprise, local people and a restaurant. And that seems very circular. Mm. I mean, I think it does depend on, on where you are. Obviously, in the middle of central London, that's quite a you know slightly trickier thing to do. But I think there are yeah. there's amazing these people are doing amazing things out there. Um, and I think it is just that you know I love that the um, the urban farm that they've just funded, Zootopia, um, in Greenwich in London, and just you know there's various growing underground where they grow herbs and things um, and just use rail arches in London. I think there's there needs to be more of that, but again, you know, with with the rent and the rates as they are in central London, it's it's not financially viable to to kind of take a plot of land and and, and plant it. Um, so it's very much a yeah a, a three as I said a three sixty approach and change from I guess what we've all grown up with in some senses. Um, and I think it's yeah from my perspective, it's how do I get those amazing local producers. You know, I say local, it's probably within a, um, I don't know what the radius would be, but Kent and Sussex are, you know, ones that I work with where I get my fruit and vegetables from. Um, but I think it's also, yeah, it's just the actual kind of um, logistics of getting it. And I think it's very much, you know, a lot of restaurants work the other way. The, well, the normal way to work at a restaurant is to say, right, I want, you know, for instance, 20 sirloin steaks for tomorrow and... 30 perfect carrots and et cetera, et cetera. And it's very much done on a, I guess, demand basis. And I think, you know, in a way it'd be great to flip that to a supply basis. And that's what I'm trying to do with my suppliers is say, right, what, what have you got? What do you need to get rid of? How can I then incorporate that on my menu for the next week, et cetera? How do I make the most of, I guess, you know, in that, in that circular economy and saying, right, if they've got excess of, um, you know, one cut of beef that they've got eggs on, then I can take that and they can, because they can easily get rid of the rest of it. Same with vegetables. And I think, you know, embracing the wonkiness is something that um, I love because I think it, it tells the story of where it's from and, and we know that farm that it's come from. Um, and because it's not perfect, it's, yeah, I think it's embracing the imperfect really because that's, to me, food shouldn't ever be perfect because it's very much an individual, um, you know, every cow's different, every carrot's different. We shouldn't, be aiming for consistency and, and perfection we should be aiming for flavor um and how to maximize that and if it looks a bit wonky or if you know again you know one cow that's eaten more clover versus one that's eaten more chicory it, but you know there's potentially going to be a taste difference here so i think that notion of yeah consistency and perfection that consumers demand needs to slightly flip the other way really I mean, what you say it just reminds me about the from a supply chain perspective. In my in my previous life, I I remember reading about New York and New York have all these flat roofs, and they decided to put tennis courts and basketball courts on the on the top of the roofs. And I said, why don't we put bees on the top of our roof? Mm. Uh, and then I was like, oh, you're completely nuts. Why would we do that? You can't put bees on a you know, business roof. And they put bees on. Well, they put a garden up there, then they put bees up there, and now they produce honey and actually give honey to their clients. You think, well, it's not so hard. Um, but it's then, as you, the next step would be, okay, well, I'm now in, at a restaurant in central London. How do I source the guys that are with the bees? And or um, you know, maybe there's, there's, that, there's that steak and how do, we, how do we get the steak? One of the things I always thought about restaurants is uh, using technology, getting guests to choose before they come. Yes, there'll be a you know, potential change, but most people kind of know what they want to eat. And if they've looked at your menu before, which they all have, it's going to go, up, well, we think we're going to have this, 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 and this. And then you know what you need to procure uh, and there's, there's less waste. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's it, kind of the dream is to have a tasting menu that didn't necessarily have a choice. And it's like, well, this, or yeah, the flip side of that is having a tasting menu that that's all you serve. And so, you know, each one could be different. I mean, they do that at Blue Hill at Stone Barns in upstate New York with Dan Barber. And it's, it's incredible. It's, there is no menu. You go there, you <laughs> sit down and you, you're, you're, the, the server has a chat with you, decides, you know, sees what you, what you're interested in, what you like, what you don't like. And then your menu is kind of created on the spot with what's in the kitchen. Um, huge amount more work in some respects and more thought, but it is the very essence of kind of a circular economy because there is no waste. It's all contained within that. And it's all of the moment, which is also really wonderful. And, and, and it's the inspiration of the chef, which I suppose is what people want to come for. It's because you, you can create the most delightful, tasty food and actually it doesn't matter. It's just as long as it's super tasty though, yeah, that's, that's the part of the journey. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, so COP26, I always ask, are you going? Because if you are, I'm super jealous. I'm not sure yet. TBC, <laughs> <laughs> oh, TBC. Well, yeah. I have fingers crossed that you are going. Yeah. Um, but regardless, what do you think needs to come out of out of COP26? Um, action, I would say. Um, action and implementation rather than just, just chat. Okay, so real, real milestones, real short-term, real deliverables. Um, yeah, and actually I think, you know, there's one thing I always kind of struggle with, I guess, when there are all these conversations and platforms etc is there's a lot of chat about the kind of um the what but not so much about the how um and it's like right this is what we need to do but how do we do it and i think that's yeah. very much for restaurants as well a lot of them know know what needs to happen but it, there's no how and there's no kind of guide to it there's no directory there's no kind of best practice as yet and i think that's yeah i guess part of what i hope to be able to kind of um, contribute to in the next kind of 12 to 24 months is to find you know, find the ways and, and make it easier for everybody else to actually you know make those changes and, and action them rather than just kind of get confused by it all really yeah if not me then who it's mm. getting out there and actually doing it and yeah, there's a lot of people who've got lots of chat but they've got to actually do it which is the yeah uh, when the, the rubber hits the road um, okay, so actions coming out of actions coming out of Glasgow, and, and um, I hope that with this series we're going to package them all together, and I'm going to send them to everybody, <laughs> make sure that they listen, um, and that'll be that'll be a, a major takeaway. So, uh, the, again, the point is the tips and the tricks and how we can all move faster and you know forward. Again, one of the questions to, to one that's a kind of a business thing, and another one is a you thing. If you had a magic wand in the restaurant world, what would you do to make it more sustainable? That's a really... Um, it's a tough question. I it's know. a very tough question. It's a, big, it's a big question. Yeah, there's, there's a lot I would do. And I think, you know, because it's also, I think if we look at the word sustainability, it's, it's 360 again. It's very much, you know, from my perspective, it's people, purpose, planet and profit. And it's got to be sustainable from all four of those. And, but on the flip side, we don't want to just sustain what we're doing. We want to improve it. Um, and, you know, our industry's been for a pretty harrowing 12 to 14 months, really. Um, and we're still, you know, the challenges are still very, very real. And it's, yeah, it is, you know, it's in a pretty bad place, I would say, to be honest. Um, although there's amazing things that have come out of COVID and there's amazing things that are happening now there's still a lot to challenge, a lot of challenges. And I think the staffing crisis is one that we're all facing yeah. right now, which, you know, restaurants are being forced to close certain days of the week, certain services. So that's not sustainable. Um, it's not financially sustainable when you can't pay your rent because you've not got enough revenue coming in. You can't pay your team what you want to pay them, et cetera. So I think if we look at that perspective, you know, the, I guess probably one of the, the biggest things that I would wave my magic wand at would be that the true cost of food and running a restaurant is recognized and thus 
actioned by consumers um, because I don't think it is at all. I think it's there's a there's a vast abyss between what actually happens versus what you know people are paying for and what they expect, what their expectations are. Um, food shouldn't be cheap; it should be affordable, and everybody should have access to it 100%. But in terms of what happens in a restaurant and everything that goes into it, it's not often reflected in the pricing strategy because consumers don't want to pay it. So I think that would potentially solve a number of issues. It would solve obviously farmers, producers that would get paid the true value of the work that they put in as well. Um, the teams that work within hospitality would be paid appropriately um, for the, again, for the skill that they have. And, you know, everything would, I guess, you know, then the actions that we need to take to reduce waste, to reduce carbon, um, would all come into that as well, because I think that's, that's where we need to get to. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Transparency um, is, is critical. Nearly there. Last two questions. Um, favorite sustainability brands that you think are leading the way that we can take inspiration from? Oh, there's, there's numerous ones, I would say. Um, I think it's, yeah, and there's more kind of cropping up as you go. I mean, I think some of the, you know, the innovative ones, um, I think we need to get to a place where we, where we, we are reusing and repurposing, not single use. So I think brands that are trying to um, make that happen are really interesting. Um, and I think that, yeah, there's a lot more that, that can happen, but there's amazing brands like Collie Box that are looking at reusable takeaway packaging. Um, the cup schemes, again, with coffee cups, you know, th there's no reason we should have disposable coffee cups, really, in the scheme of things. Um, and obviously what, what Delphus is doing. Um, and just, I th yeah, I think there's a lot that are out there, but again, sometimes they're slightly harder to find. Um, but I think there's, yeah, it feels like it's kind of we're on the cusp of, of things being a lot more prominent and being available. Um, when it comes to food, you know, brands like Toast Ale that take the stale bread, um, Ruby's in the Rubble, again, they do very cool stuff. Um, so more of that I would like to see for sure. Cool. And uh, the last question, um, podcasts and or books that you've read that you think we should all be listening to, the, the stuff that inspires you? Um, I'm not really a podcast listener, to be honest. Um, <laughs> probably don't really have the time, unfortunately. But I do, um, actually in saying that though, this is how I actually got onto the role, is the Re London, which is formerly the London Waste and Recycling Board, of which I'm a, a board member of. They've got some really interesting um, people on there about sector economy. So that's also, I've learned some things off that. Um, books silo the silo book from doug mcmaster is great for restaurants or even at home um in terms of single use really being able to find ways to minimize that you know get rid of cling film etc um Zootopia, uh by carolyn Steele is a really interesting thought-provoking book as well um and her former book hungry city i believe it is is also a really interesting book um that is probably the extent of what I've read in the past 12 months um, that have given me, you know, given me that inspiration, I would say. Yeah, it's been quite a challenging 12 months, quite a busy one, bizarrely. Um, so they probably, yeah, that's probably my, my kind of top picks. Fantastic. 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 Well, I mean, the big takeaways are obviously we need a platform. We need a better platform. And that's part of part of this is the platform. We need we need action coming from government as in, you know let's real things that we can aim at and target. Mm -hmm. Circularity is 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 critical, and the the manufacturers of tomorrow need to be thinking about circularity, like toast and rubies, which are two of my favourites as well. Um, and the the piece around staff, it, it, it's it's slightly overlooked, and I think it's absolutely critical that we we. We make sure we bring everybody along on the journey. Mm. Um, absolutely fantastic. Chantal, thank you so much for your time and for your inspiration and for uh, your thoughts. And I will, we will, we'll write this up and, um, 
and we'll send it to you and, and hopefully we get it in front of some of the leaders and go, <laughs> yeah, yes. there are real people doing real things and we're trying to, trying to make a difference. We're the doers. No, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Right. Okay, bye. Bye.